Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you, friends and um, family and brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to talk about obedience today, a subject that um, we probably talk about, uh, should talk about <laughs> more often than we do. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about counting the cost. I'm going to be using the scriptures out of Luke 6 and 46 through 49. And, um, and I'll go ahead and start by reading that, okay? Uh, this message is about obedience. It is a message everyone actually knows these scriptures and... Um, if I can bring a little bit more out in it to cause it to be any clearer, I'll certainly try to do that. Um, Luke 6, chapter 6, verse 40, starting at 46 through 49. But why do you call me Lord and, do, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom... He is like He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the the stream beat down hard against that house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But verse 49, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of the house was very great. So we're going to talk about that today. Your body is the house that God is building. Let's look at it like that as we go through these scriptures. One of the warning signs of our society of our eroding society here in America is that um, the rebellion against authority and if we think about it we we can think about our children they're rebelling against the authority of their parents in many cases students against teachers and citizens are rebelling against the authority of law enforcement and then, of course, many politicians are rebelling against the authority even of the United States Constitution. That is a, a lot of disobedience, a lot of rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And I did not write down that verse. I apologize for that. Anyway, whenever authority is rejected... Uh, lawlessness and sinfulness abound in the land. You know, so we need to stop today and think, who do we really submit to, for one thing? If, if, if I were to ask you, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Probably most everyone here would probably say yes. But if I were to ask you, uh, is Jesus Christ your Lord? Probably everybody that can hear this question right now would probably say, uh, many of you might be very hesitant actually to answer that question. For one thing, there's a false doctrine that is being preached in many of our churches today that a person can be saved by Jesus without surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is a false doctrine. And um, this doctrine has tickled the ears of millions who are looking for the shortest and the easiest road to heaven. The pews uh, of our American churches, and I will say this boldly, are filled with plenty of churchgoers who profess to be Christians, and yet their morals and their lifestyles are no different than those uh, sinners out in the world who never knew Jesus. Those outside of Christ, you would not know a, their, this professing Christian's life 
If you looked at their life, you would know no difference between them and someone who did not know the Lord. Now that is gotten to the point of being a real shame. The church is preaching such a shallow message that uh, the sinners can go to church, Christians can go to church, and their life is not right with God, and they don't even come under conviction. So we could think of it this way as well in regard to authority. You know, if you had a store or a business and you had employees and they refuse to submit to your authority or to the boss's authority, he's going to get fired or she's going to get fired. And say uh, someone is in the military and maybe they're a captain or something and uh, they don't submit to authority, they're going to be dishonorably discharged from the military. Or maybe even like a, a ball player or a person in sports refuses to submit to their authority, their coach or trainer, whoever. They're, they're kicked off the team, I would think, normally. Today, you know, maybe they've changed the rules. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's how it used to be. So if this principle applies in, this, in the world, how much more... Does it apply to being a true disciple of Jesus Christ? He is our authority. He is over us. So the, the New Testament refers to Jesus as Lord over 600 times. And yet, he's only referred to as Savior about 17 times. And that would depend on whichever uh, version of the Bible that you're reading. So... Check it out if you want to and and see what a diversity of numbers there from 600 to 17. So that says a lot about the importance of the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. It tells us if Jesus is our Savior, you know what? He must also be the Lord of our lives. He cannot be one without being the other. If we go back to Luke chapter 6, there are three reasons why obedience is not optional. It is not optional in the life of a true disciple. It might be optional for some, but it is not optional in the life of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. First of all, obedience isn't optional because it is the truest test of his lordship. In verse 46, it says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do, and not do, excuse me, and not do the things which I say? Uh, this ch sixth chapter of Luke, it, it contains a called, what is called a Sermon on the Plain. And we're all familiar with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But this Sermon on the Plain is actually Luke's account uh, of, of the version of the same thing in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount of what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. So in this uh, Sermon on the Plain is just 29 verses long. It begins in verse 20 of this chapter and it ends in verse 49 and I could read it but I'm not going to <clears throat> that figure my my phone has to ring right now <laughs> okay um, anyway Jesus is on the mountain in this plain sermon on the plain he's on the mountain and he's preaching to these multitudes of people they had gathered there to hear him just like on the sermon on the mount uh, of matthew's description of it and if we had been there that day we would have said wow look at all these people and we would have just stood in awe at what god was doing there but you know what jesus could see on the inside of the hearts and he did he saw some that were genuinely wanting to follow him but he could also see that there were many that were, maybe they were just there out of curiosity. Uh, maybe they were just trying to 
check up on him and see what he was doing. Maybe he might perform a miracle. Who knows? But by what Jesus said earlier in verse 37 through 42, it is possible that there were more than a few hypocritical Pharisees there or blind guides sitting there that day. And, and knowing what was in the hearts of, of some of the people, Jesus spoke these words in verse 46. He said, but, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Obviously, if he said that to a crowd of people, there are people there that were not obeying him, and he was speaking directly to, and I'm sure they knew who they were. Um, so Jesus, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So uh, here we're speaking about obedience as well. He who obeys. So, you know, I, I personally, I could pray, Dear Lord, give me this and give me that. And dear Lord, please do this and please do that. And I can say, praise the Lord. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. A hundred times a day. And I can mention the Lord in my conversation so I sound spiritual. But if I am not willing to submit to his authority over my life and obey what he commands me to do, to call Jesus Lord is not only meaningless and empty, it's offensive. It is offensive to Christ. Jesus has taught us right. He's given us the word. We know how we are supposed to be acting, how we are supposed to be obeying, and then we blatantly sin against him. That is an offense. He paid a high price for us to be born again. So he isn't flattered by it. He isn't impressed by it. He isn't even honored by it. He is offended by it. It is our obedience to him that gives meaning to our words. So obedience isn't optional because it is it is actually the true test of lordship. We could say all day long, and I've said this before in messages, I, I could tell my husband all day long, I love you, I love you, I love you. But if I do not act and, and my words and deeds and actions do not line up to what I'm saying, <clears throat> excuse me, I hardly believe that he's going to believe me. And, and it's, it's probably not true what I'm saying out of my mouth. And the same with Christians. So we've got to watch our own hearts. We have to lay our whole life down for Christ. He laid his whole life down for us. I do realize it is a process and we're all in the process. Uh, Jesus teaches us a second thought on obedience. It's not optional because it is the foundation that will stand the test of time and eternity. Verses 47 and 48. And I will read those. Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. So the, that's our part right there. We have to hear and we have to do. He said, I will show you whom he is like. <clears throat> <clears throat> He's like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it because or for it was founded on the rock. So this is Luke's version of Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders that we read about in Matthew. So this first home builder represents the wise man who not only hears the words of Jesus, but he obeys the words of Jesus. But then notice this man goes to the trouble of digging deep and digging deep into the soil, taking his time and going deeper and deeper until he hits bedrock. 
and he anchors the foundation of his house to that bedrock so that his house is built on solid ground. He cares about his house. We're building in this body of flesh, this house of ours, we are building a foundation for Christ. In time of a great flood or great storm came, and as the flood waters rose and beat against the house, the house could not be shaken because it was built on the rock. Now that house represents our lives. Our lives have got to be built on the rock. And it can't be built by just hearing. You have to hear and you have to put some action to that. You have to obey what you hear. The sure and solid foundation is our obedience to Jesus' commands. It's our obedience that fastens us to the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. The trials that are in uh, our present life right now, all of the hardships that we go through, um, everything we go through, trials, hardships, sorrows, griefs, setbacks, disappointments, valleys, deserts, bad days, good days, trials are like floodwaters pounding against our house. How are we going to stand during that? Are we going to just be blown in the wind or are we going to be able to stand strong because we are building upon the rock? Hopefully we're going to be able to stand strong. But the floodwaters also represent our future judgment when we must appear before Christ and give an account of our lives. So the only way our house or ourself will withstand the floodwaters of judgment is to have lived a life of obedience to the Lord. Again, uh, obedience is not optional because it is the true test of His Lordship in our life. It's not option optional because it's the foundation that will stand the test of time. It's not optional because those who do not obey Christ face certain destruction it says in verse 49 verse 49 says but he who heard and did nothing listen to that scripture friends he he heard but he didn't do anything but he heard but he didn't do anything he did not do his part it's like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat against it and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So when you look at this guy who built his house without a foundation, don't you wonder why would he do something so crazy? There, um... There's probably a lot of reasons why he would. For one thing, it involved a lot of work. It involved a lot of time. It involved a lot of digging by hand all the way down to the bedrock, which was really hard work. And maybe the foolish man was, uh, I, I'm going to say, lazy. He was just lazy. And that's the way some of us are, too, with the Word of God, with studying the Word of God, with staying in our uh secret place with the Lord and receiving from heaven. So it was just a whole lot easier for this guy and a whole lot less time uh, to just throw up four walls, slap on a roof on his house, and then spend all that time digging down rather than spend all that time digging down to the bedrock. He was too, he didn't want to do that. He was too lazy. Spiritually speaking, disobedience is much easier than obedience. Disobedience uh, sometimes seems like the fastest route to get where you want to, to uh, be. 
than obedience because obedience is going to take some time. If you've got to dig down, if you've got to build on that foundation and build on that foundation and build on that foundation, it's going to take you some time. So if you're impatient, if you're lazy, you are not going to want to take that time. You're going to want to do the quick route, the fastest route to get done what you think needs to be done. But I guarantee you the most important thing that needs to be done is the foundation to be built upon the rock. Then another reason why this uh, foolish man didn't bother to build on a solid foundation was because he was probably, like so many today, looking for instant gratification. He wanted to get get in his house as quickly as possible, get his house set up. He wanted, uh, spiritually speaking, a lot of people... Uh, don't want to obey Christ because they would rather have instant gratification. They want everything instantly. He, he wanted that house quickly. He wanted that house to look good quickly. So many people would rather enjoy the temporary pleasure of sin than to wait for long-term rewards, for the long-term rewards of obedience. And then another reason why this man didn't bother to build the foundation is, is for what I just said a minute ago, outward appearance. He wanted a house. He wanted the house to look good. He wanted uh, more than inward depth. He thought, why waste all that time building a foundation nobody is ever going to see? But you know what? That foundation is important. And as, as Christians, we have got to see that it's important. He probably thought, you know what, I'll spend my time putting up the best looking house in town. I'll paint the exterior, the brightest colors. I'll build a beautiful porch on it and all my neighbors are going to see it. And I'll put the best looking roof on my house that money can buy. And as, as long as my house looks good on the outside, who cares if it don't have a foundation? Maybe that's what he was thinking. Maybe that was his shallow thinking, I should say. But you know what? We can't think like that as Christians. We've got to have a good foundation. And maybe the outside's not going to look so good sometimes. We're building a foundation. Spiritually speaking, this is actually what a lot of professing Christians do. They do it fast. They don't take their time every day to build on that foundation. They focus on outward appearances rather than inward depth. And just as long as they keep up with the outward appearances of being spiritual, no one's ever going to suspect that, that they have no real depth or they have no real substance. You know, nobody's going to see that, but God knows. They're going to know when the winds come and blow and the storms come. Listen, the chances of a flood is not 50-50. It's 100%. There's a 100% chance you're going to get hit by a flood of trials. And there's a 100% chance that you're going to stand before Christ in the judgment. And if you're living in willful disobedience to the Lord, if your Christianity is nothing more than an outward appearance, you will come to ruin and so will your house. It will be destroyed. The Bible's real clear on that, just in the few verses that I've read. So obedience to Jesus is not an option. It is not optional any way, shape, or form. When we hear, we must do. What we hear, we must do. So if we're to be true disciples of the Lord, we, we've got to face the issues uh, on obedience That has to be a priority in our life. We've got to want to serve the Lord in excellence. And when I, you know, I talk about the commands and stuff, I talk, I'm talking about the commands of Jesus. There are many in the New Testament. I'm not talking about the commands of the Old Testament. Those are written on our hearts. We should know those very well, and we should be able to do those. If we've been born again. But there are other commands that Jesus has given us all along that we should be doing. And I'm reading you the scriptures telling you what the Bible says about it. 
we have to understand that the most joyful people on earth are those who do obey the Lord, and the most miserable of all men are those who disobey. And the cost of disobedience, let me tell you, is far greater than the cost of obedience. The cost of disobedience will cost you your whole life and your whole eternity. So in closing, let me just say this. Let us count the cost in regard to building a firm foundation. And let us count the cost in doing it every day. So it takes you an hour a day. That's an hour out of, of 24 hours. That leaves you 23 hours to sleep and do what you want to do. Okay, just throwing that out there. All right, God bless you each and every one. Bye-bye.